How well do you know your fish? Learn how to say your favorite fish and seafood in English in this fishy episode of Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. Hello and welcome to the podcast, especially if you're a new listener. And if you're coming back to listen again, welcome to you too. My name's Craig. And my name's Reza. And we've been teaching for more than 45 years. We're bringing all of that experience to this podcast to help you grow your grammar, vocalize your vocabulary and perfect your pronunciation, taking all of your English to the next level. This week, fish and 10 English fish you really should know when you're traveling and looking at an English menu. Reza, what do we have on the list this week? Well, what have we got for lunch or dinner or breakfast, if you like? Uh, and my apologies if you're a vegetarian <laughs> as well. Let's start our list with soul. Now, I'm not talking about el alma, not S-O-U-L. I'm talking about S-O-L-E, soul. What's that? For Spanish speakers, Craig. That's lenguado. Lenguado, very popular fish on Spanish menus as well. It's a flat fish. And it's one of those fish, I think, that feed on the bottom of the ocean. So we call them bottom feeders. Soul. Do you like soul? I do. I like most fish. One that many people like in Britain and Ireland and all over the world is our next one. Cod. C-O-D. Very important for the Spanish too, bacalao. And even more important if you go to Portugal. It's basically the, it's the national dish of Portugal. Everything has cod in Portugal. And wow, they, they do really great things with it. Do you like cod, Craig? I love cod. I'm not very keen on sole because I don't like fish that has a lot of bones. Espinas or bones. I don't like bony fish, bony fish with lots of bones. Mm -hmm. But cod is really, really typical in the UK if you go into a fish and chips shop to eat fish and chips, you'll probably see cod on the menu. Be careful of the pronunciation of fish and chips. We don't usually say fish and chips. The and becomes mm, just <laughs> mm, fish, and, fish and chips, fish and chips. So cod is ideal, you're saying, Craig, because it doesn't have many small bones. It only has some big bones which you can take out easily. So it's perfect for fish and chips to cover it in batter. Batter is el rebozado, yeah? Uh, maybe with a bit of beer, a bit of egg, a bit of flour. Not to be confused with butter. Not butter, not B-U, B-A-T-T-E-R. So you can batter big pieces of it and probably there won't be any bones in it. So it's ideal for British fish and chips. And it's very good to fry because the meat of the fish is quite hard, isn't it? We wouldn't say tough. I don't think we'd say tough as we would to describe steak or meat. But the actual meat of the fish, when you fry it, it doesn't fall apart. Not, not this athe. Maybe like sole wood. So cod, yeah, very good to fry. Now, the next one is a fish which comes in many varieties. Craig, if I said in Spanish, trucha, what's that fish? That's trout, T-R-O-U-T, trout, which you can buy fresh and fry or bake, but you can also smoke trout. Have you ever had smoked trout? I like smoked trout. It's very nice. Yeah. Now, there are different types of trout. And in Spain, you can buy both the pink trout, which you call trucha asalmonada, strangely, for me. We call it pink trout, trucha rosa, but you don't say that. And the other one, which is white trout. I don't like the white trout at all. I find white trout a bit bland. That means so, so. Not much taste. Not much taste. I much prefer the pink trout. Do you like either of them? No, it's not one of my favorite fish. I prefer cod or, or salmon that we'll talk about later. But I do eat trout and I like most white fish. But no, a trout is not one of my favorites. And neither is the next one on our list, which is hake. H-A-K-E. Hake. 
What's hake in Spanish? Merluza. That's really common here, isn't it? From what I can see in the Levante area of Spain, it's probably the most commonly served fish in restaurants, I yeah. would say. You often see it on the lunchtime menu, the menu del dia. You see merluza or hake everywhere. Because it's easy to cook. It's not expensive. It doesn't have a very strong taste. So most people will eat it. Personally, though, that's precisely why I'm not a huge fan of hake. I find it a bit boring. Yeah, quite bland. Quite bland. It's all right. I'll eat it. And it's got quite a few bones compared to cod. So I'd rather have cod, which is similar because it has fewer bones. Would you agree? Yep, definitely. Absolutely. The typical Valencian way of eating hake is in salsa verde. That's the traditional way. I think they put loads of parsley, perejil, and a few other things in a sauce, and they tend to put that on hake. But in the United Kingdom, it will probably just be fried. Yeah. And another fish you might not know in English is grouper. G-R-O-U-P-E-R. So group <laughs> with E-R on the end. Grouper. What's grouper in Spanish? Well, I, you know, I didn't know this till, till Craig told me the other day. I didn't know the English uh, or I didn't know the connection. It's mero. So I, I know all about Spanish mero. I like that. But I didn't realize I was eating grouper. Because I don't think it's that common in the UK. You don't often see grouper on the menu no. in restaurants in the UK. And, and I like it. I eat it a lot in Spain. And I had heard the word grouper, but I didn't know that it was mero. Is it very firm, hard meat? It's quite firm. It yes, is. It's yeah. quite firm. Yeah. Maybe something similar to cod in texture, but a mm -hmm. different taste. Yep. I like it. Another very popular fish is bass. B A double -S, S. Bass. In Spanish, lubina or roballo. Do you like that? Bass. I do. I like bass. For me, bass, or sometimes people say sea bass as well. It's quite a subtle, sutil. S-U-B-T-L-E, subtle. It's not a strong flavor, but if you treat it with a delicate sauce or don't put anything strong in with it, it can be nice. Yeah, And it's very like soft it. flesh, isn't it? It's not very hard. It's a softer fish. One that's a little bit harder, I think, and chewier perhaps, is monkfish. Monkfish, M-O-N-K-F-I-S-H, monkfish, which is rape. That's the ugly one, isn't it? That's yes. the one that you see is really, really ugly. Yeah. Monkfish, uh, pez monje. Monk is monje. I wonder, looking at a monkfish, el rape, does it look like the kind of stereotype of a fat, ugly monk? Perhaps that's why we call it monkfish in, in English. I don't know. Well, that's a very good way for our listeners to remember the name. When you see that big, ugly rape, just mm. think of a big, ugly monk, and it's a fish, monkfish. Easy to remember. Something I just discovered recently because a friend of mine made me a delicious dish, which was a Thai from Thailand, a Thai curry made with monkfish, which was delicious. And I, I asked my friend why she had used monkfish. And she explained there are hardly any bones at all in monkfish. It's, it's virtually all flesh. So it's perfect just to cut big bits and throw them into things like curry or stew, estofado, and you're probably not going to get any bones. And it's quite a, a hard flesh, so it will it will resist or it will withstand, resist deer, quite a lot of cooking, which is good for stews and curries and things so like that. So it won't break up as you're cooking it. It won't break up. And it's a strong flavor, but whenever you cook it for a long time, then that strong taste weakens a bit. So I discovered it's perfect for slow cooking. So if you were to cook a curry, would you probably use monkfish for it? That would one, be one of my first choice for sure, yeah. You like fish curry, don't you? I do, yeah. I really do. The next one on the list is mackerel, M-A-C-K-E-R-E-L, mackerel, or in Spanish, caballa. I always confuse caballa and caballo, so when, <laughs> when I see that on the menu, I'm not sure if it's horse or, or fish, 
But yeah, mackerel is another really popular fish in the UK and quite a nice one too. Yes, really popular, but even so, not as popular as it used to be. No. So it's still popular, yes. But if you go back about 80 or 100 years in, in time, there are people at mackerel virtually every week of their lives. It's a blue fish, isn't it? So the oils in fish like mackerel, sardines, are very good for you because the oil is positive fat. So it's good for your body. People used to eat it a lot more in the UK and particularly Ireland, by the way. It's a classic Irish uh, dish as well, mackerel. Fresh. But now you're more likely, it's more probable that you'll find mackerel smoked Mm -hmm. in the UK. You can get it fresh, but it's not as common as smoked, like smoked trout. What I really like is Spanish style mackerel en escabeche. In other words, uh, vinegar. So whenever you put the mackerel in with vinegar and spices and leave it for a day or two, that's one of my favorite things. I really like that. And it's also really, really good for you. As Craig said, it's got the omega-3, the omega-6, hardly any fat. It's the good cholesterol. It's it's a wonder food. And next one is a direct translation. Loses nothing in translation. Peth espada is swordfish. So it's one word in English, swordfish, S-W-O-R-D-F-I-S-H. Another fish that's really common on menus, at least here in Valencia, and one that I quite like because the meat is fairly, fairly hard. It's not a very soft fish and it does have taste. And yeah, I like swordfish. What about you? I like it if it's fresh, but sadly, I think it's often frozen when they serve it and not good quality. And, and you notice it when it's not a good quality swordfish. For me, I want to buy it in the market. And we're lucky in Valencia, we got one of the best markets for fish probably in Europe, I would say. And cook it yourself. Uh, not just the central market, but you've got the Cabanal market as well down by the beach. We, we, we're really lucky. And if I buy my swordfish fresh and cook it quick, then yeah. But frozen from mm. a not particularly good restaurant is not going to inspire me. Yeah, I agree. The the last one, we weren't sure whether to put it on the list or not because it's so obvious. You might think, well, I'm not going to learn much. That is salmon. So it's spelled the same as Spanish. But we're putting it on the list because of the pronunciation. That's what causes the difficulty. Salmon. That L in the middle is not pronounced. Salmon. Everybody knows what salmon is. It's one of my least favorite fish. Really? Yeah. It's my favorite fish. Huh? <laughs> one of my least favorite. I love salmon when it's grilled and I love uh, any kind of fresh salmon, even when it's boiled. I love the taste and especially smoked salmon, one of my favorite delicacies. Very good um, Scandinavian or, or Scottish smoked salmon is, wow, fantastic. I do like smoked salmon, yeah, though I prefer smoked trout. I don't know why, it just seems to have a slightly richer taste. Mm -hmm. But for me, salmon is often cooked in a bland way. For me, just grilled salmon with nothing else, I find a bit boring. Do you put any spice or any seasoning on it? I just love the taste. And one of my favorite dishes here in Spain is salmón a la plancha, salmon, grilled salmon, with patatas a la pobre, which is <laughs> sautéed potatoes with some onion perhaps mixed in. And, oh, wow, that's, for me, that's the best. For me, I'm more attracted to the patatas a la pobre than the salmon. <laughs> yeah. So those are our but, 10. Hold on, can oh. I just mention one more thing? Mm-hmm. There's a fish we haven't put on the list because it's just so obvious what it is. But since it might be my favorite fish of all time... You have to mention it. And it's extremely, extremely common in Spain, and many Spanish people like it as well. I'm going to mention the humble, el humilde, or la humilde, I should say, feminine, sardine. Mm -hmm. I love, I adore sardines. Another bluefish. Another bluefish. In fact, I like them more than mackerel. How do you like them cooked? just about any way you can think of but particularly barbecued oh wow barbecued sardines are just so good i do like sardines but for me they're just a little bit too small and bony so you don't actually get much meat from them you have to eat a lot 
But I like eating them socially because they're one like one of the things you could have a tapa. And when you're eating tapas, you just have a, some sardines on a plate and just help yourself. It's very social food. And I do like the taste, yeah. The thing is, in Spain and Portugal and other countries in the Mediterranean, as you know, it's very easy to get hold of, to get a supply of sardines. They're cheap. They're plentiful. It's no big deal. Nothing special. But in the United Kingdom... It's not so easy to get fresh sardines. Do you like, do you like tinned easy. sardines? You see, I don't really like them tinned. I'll eat them tinned. Me neither. But it's not at all the same as fresh sardines, which are cheap here and easy. However, here's a weird thing. I, I For some reason, I prefer tinned mackerel to fresh mackerel. I actually prefer that from a tin. But if it's like an olive oil mm-hmm. and nicely done, or as I said, escabeche. But fresh mackerel is a bit too strong of a flavor, where sardine is is just right. It's strong, but it's not too strong. You know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. So those are our 10 fish. Sole, cod, trout, hake, grouper, bass or sea bass, monkfish, mackerel, swordfish and salmon. Remember, you can see the spelling of these words in the show notes at inglespodcast.com slash two one seven now it wouldn't really be fair only to look at fish or white fish let's look at some shellfish and seafood to make sure you know the English words for these 10 possibly most popular kinds of seafood and shellfish that you'd see on a menu if you were to travel to an English-speaking country. Reza, what's on the list? Well, of course, we've started with one of the world's favourite types of seafood, lobster. L-O-B-S-T-E-R. Langosta or bogavante, lobster. Spanish lobster is supposed to be one of the tastiest, I think, especially from the north. Is it Galician lobster it's supposed to be really, really good? Not as big as in other countries, but very, very strong, tasty flavor. That's what they say, and I'm sure that's true. But the thing is, about half the time when you order lobster in Spain, it probably comes from Ireland or Scotland. Really? Yeah, a lot of it is imported to Spain. Because it's not as popular in Ireland and Scotland. Right. Although it is eaten, but it's much more popular in Spain. And they don't have enough supply in Spain. So this fantastic Spanish lobster you're eating might well be Irish. Remember <laughs> that next time you're eating it. Are you a fan? Do you like lobster? I do from time to time. It's not an easy thing to eat. You can literally cut yourself quite badly eating it. you got to oh, be careful. So it's a bit Fiddly. Fiddly means difficult, awkward. you got to cut this, take that out, watch this, put this in your mouth, etc. But yes, the taste is worth the effort. Mm -hmm. Do you eat lobster a lot? I'm not keen on any shellfish and seafood. I don't really like much uh, shellfish and seafood. Lobster, no, because as you say, there's a lot of work involved to actually get to the food. So... No, I'm not a fan of lobster. However, I do quite like prawns, P-R-A-W-N-S, which are gambas. Prawns are pretty common here also, and uh, I I do like prawns. How do you like your prawns? Already peeled? Yes. You you like, (laughs) yeah, okay. You probably realise I don't like working too hard for my food. So yeah, if they're already peeled... Or if they're with avocados, for example, oh, me served too. as mm. a starter, prawns and avocados, I really like. Me too. I love that. You know what, Craig? You've got to try in Alicante, a typical dish called arroz del señoret. I've heard of that. Yeah. Arroz del señorito, mm-hmm. which is basically a rice dish with seafood, mm-hmm. but del señorito, you know, of the master. So everything has been peeled, all bones taken out. Everything there is edible. That's what's of the señorito. So it's typical of Alicante where they've prepared everything for people who don't like fiddling around. That's me. 
you, you must give that a go. I will do, yeah. I don't particularly like seafood paella. I much prefer chicken and rabbit paella. But yeah, if we're together in Alicante one day, then we'll definitely have that together. Yeah. I know one thing Craig won't be having is probably squid. No, I'm not a fan of squid. Squid is calamar. And I do sometimes eat fried squid occasionally. Again, if it's in the tapa on the table, I'll take one or two. But no, I wouldn't necessarily order squid for myself. Do you like squid? From time to time. It's not something I eat every week or even every month. But yeah, from time to time. But for me, it's something which must be properly cooked. If you don't cook squid properly, it's awful because it's going to be... Like rubber. Rubber. Rubbery. You know, como goma, which is horrible. Reza didn't say lovely. He said rubbery. Rubbery, yeah. Maybe you thought it was a Chinese person saying lovely. Oh, that's rubbery. No, no, no rubbery. Rubbery. <laughs> and like I'm not rubber. saying robbery. Not un, un robo, no, not robbery. Rubbery. Well, there are, there are some restaurants here in Valencia on the beach that will be like robbery if you, if you went and had squid there because of the prices. <laughs> Quite similar to squid is cuttlefish, which is sepia. Cuttlefish, C U T T L E F I S H. Cuttlefish, quite similar, isn't it? Yes, I'm not even really sure of the difference. What is it? Is one bigger and the other smaller? I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'm not sure either because I don't really eat either so much. So probably the taste is slightly different, but cuttlefish can also be rubbery if you don't have it very fresh or it's not cooked properly. But if it is fresh and cooked properly, it can be lovely. <laughs> it can be lovely. <laughs> not rubbery, but lovely. Those are things which are not at all popular in the UK. Yeah, you can get them, but they're not liked by many people. No, you wouldn't necessarily see those in the supermarket up for sale on the fish counter. One thing you might see, uh, similar to lobster, is crab. C-R-A-B, crab, cangrejo. Again, for me, too much work. Like opening the lobster. The crab, <laughs> like the lobster. Opening the crab, taking out small pieces of meat. I know it's tasty and I understand why people enjoy crab, but it's not my cup of tea. Have you ever had dressed crab? Well, I usually eat dressed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't usually eat in the nude. What, oh. is, what is dressed crab? Is it with a salad or something? No, dressed crab. It's a strange expression, isn't it? But that's, that's what they call it. Dressed crab is when they've done all the work for you and they, ah. they mush up all the edible good meat, take away everything that you're not going to eat, and they, they put it inside the main shell, the shell, like the, la cascara of the crab, and all you have to do is eat it. Have oh, you ever had yeah, that? that? No, I haven't, but that would be interesting for me. If I went to a good restaurant that had dressed crab, then yeah, I would possibly order it. Now, Craig, ¿te gustan las almejas? Do you like clams? No, I wouldn't touch clams with a barge pole. Oh, what does that mean? To touch something, a barge pole. A barge is a boat with a very, very large pole, ballo, very, very long so the idea of touching something that you don't like with a very, very long stick to keep away from it, if you say, I wouldn't even touch it with a barge pole, you wouldn't go near it. You really don't like it. So that's my opinion of clams. Not, I don't see the attraction. I don't get why people enjoy clams. I've tasted them. For me, they don't have much taste. I've tasted them a few times. And clams, almejas, C-L-A-M-S. Are you a, a fan of clams? Not really, but, you know, I'll try just about anything. And particularly if I know something's good for you and it's not horrible, I'll, I'll eat it from time to time for the for nutritional benefits. But if there's one thing I really can't stand about clams or any type of um, shellfish is if it has sand in it. Yeah, me too. Sand. And clams very, very often do have sand it's extremely difficult to get all of the sand out and i hate it when yeah. you're eating a clam for example and then yeah you um. get that sand between your teeth for me I, I just don't want to eat anymore the texture of the sand is so horrible yeah that it's just ruined the pleasure of the food for me and i, and I don't want to if continue. i wanted sand in my food i'd make myself a sandwich <laughs> Of course. Uh, can I just say that I made a discovery the other day. I didn't know how fantastic 
clams were specifically from Chile. I was given from a very expensive tin. It was a tin, but very expensive. Chilean clams from Chile, the country. Wow, they're in another league. Yeah. They're really, really good. Chilean clams uh, really impressed me. They're much bigger, much meatier. Okay, and that's the, the and European one. Is the tiny. taste strong? Is it a strong taste? It's not stronger. It's 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 a richer flavor. Just just better. They were expensive, even from a tin. But I don't know. Maybe they're not so expensive if you're actually in Chile. Mm -hmm. So if I ever go to Chile, I know I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for clams. Interesting. Langostino. What's that in English? Langostino. That's like langosta. Yes, it's something that I really don't like. It's one of the few that I do avoid. Crayfish. So what's the difference between crayfish and lobster? Is one bigger than the other? Basically, yeah. A crayfish is like a mini lobster, although it's kind of the, the size of a big prawn, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But for me, if you think lo uh, lobsters are hard work, crayfish is just a complete pain in the neck. I can't be bothered with that. I don't think I've ever tried it. I've never had it. You know, crayfish langostino. The typical thing that they put on the top of a seafood paella because it looks nice yeah. in the, the full shell. But you try and get that shell off. It's such a pain in the neck for, you know, a, a very, very small mouthful of flesh. You can easily cut your fingers on it. It's very easy to cut yourself on crayfish. I can't be bothered. <laughs> I just, no vale la pena. I really yeah. can't be bothered with that, crayfish. That's how I feel about most shellfish. For me, crayfish is, is the most extreme. It's where I, I agree with Craig and say, I just can't be bothered to make this effort with crayfish. So the next one does not have a shell. Octopus. Pulpo. O-C-T-O-P-U-S. Octopus. I do occasionally eat octopus because I know it's quite healthy. And sometimes it's not too bad. But again, only when it's when I'm having tapas and it's in the middle of the table and I'll just have one or two small pieces. Are you a fan of octopus? I do like it when I have it. It's not something I eat every week or every month, but if it's well cooked, I enjoy it. Particularly if it's done Spanish style. What is it? They say pulpo a feira, I think. The gallego way, the way mm -hmm. they cook it in Galicia. Is that fried? I think they fry it in olive oil, I believe. And then they put it on a wooden board. They always serve it on a wooden board mm -hmm. with more olive oil on it. And paprika, pimenton. Yeah, that's and how I've had it before. I like it that way. I've also seen it like boiled and with potatoes and in stew. I don't like it quite so much that way, do you? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't probably like it that way. But at least with an octopus, unlike a chicken, if there's a big group of you, everybody gets a leg. Yes, that's true. <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm guessing the next one. Mussels, you you have a similar opinion to clams because mussels, mechionis, often have sand in them, don't they? If you don't clean them properly, you could get a mussel with sand in it. Yes, but not half as much as clams. Okay. They're much easier to clean than clams. Because clams are smaller. Yeah. So... So you like mussels, yeah? Much more than clams. I could eat mussels every week. Wouldn't bother me. I like mussels. I even like tinned mussels. Yep. Ooh, no, I yeah, wouldn't. I wouldn't go fresh. near. I wouldn't touch that with a barge pole. Tin mussels and mussels. Uh, it's a traditional and very popular Irish dish. I think they're more popular in Ireland than they are in in Britain. I don't know why, but they are. Be careful with the spelling of mussels because mussels you could also use for musculos, but the spelling's different. Mechiones are M U W -S, S E L S. The pronunciation is exactly the same. Mussels. I know one country where they're obsessed with mussels is Belgium. Belgium is famous. They have places that they call mussel house, mm -hmm. you know, mus mussel house, bars or restaurants where they basically only serve beer, mussels and chips. That that's it. And people go there to have a beer and eat mussels. It's very ah, Belgian. So mussels from Brussels isn't Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> well, he, mussels from Brussels is, is the most <laughs> mechionis. <laughs> What's the last one on the list? Well, we couldn't avoid mentioning oysters, of course. O y s t e r s, las ostras, oysters, regarded by many people as a luxury food. Maybe it's because it's said to be an aphrodisiac, uh, an aphrodisiac, something which promotes love or makes you amorous. 
So some people believe that by eating oysters, you'll get in the mood to have an intimate relationship. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a weird experience eating an oyster. It's different to all the rest we've mentioned. Do you eat oysters, Craig? I have eaten oysters. I don't like them. It didn't make me randy. If you're randy, then you feel like having sex. It didn't do that for me. I had them when I was very, very young for the first time when I was 18, traveling in Florida with my best friend. And his dad took us to an, an oyster restaurant and we had a big plate of oysters. And I didn't like the experience. I didn't like the taste. And everybody says, oh, it tastes like the sea. Well, the sea is just like salt water. So for me, I didn't like the texture, didn't like the taste. And I've tasted them since because sometimes it's good to keep trying something just to remind yourself why you don't like it. And then maybe you will like it if you try it a different way or in a different place. But no, I've never developed a taste for oysters. And then they're quite expensive, aren't they? They are fairly expensive, but not as expensive as many people think. For some reason, they've kept this reputation as a luxury food, the food of the upper classes, but it's not true. Fishermen from poor countries all over the world eat oysters on a daily basis. It's not just the food of rich people. Do you like them? I quite like them. It's not something I would want to eat every week because it's a very particular taste. And the fact that the one thing that makes them different to all the rest is you eat oysters raw. Yeah, exactly. Uncooked. With some lemon. Usually you cook mussels, you cook clams, all these other things are usually, uh, in most places in the world, cooked. But oysters are nearly always eaten uncooked. And so um, they can give you problems with your digestion, particularly if you're not used to them, if you're not accustomed to them. So you said you had a big plate of oysters in Florida. I think you started off badly by ordering a big plate. For me, it's the type of thing you eat Two, one or two or three? No, we had a plate of 12 oysters, but there were three of us. Ah, okay. So we shared the big plate. Yeah. Fair enough. And I think I had only two, maybe three, and then that for me, that was yeah. enough. I didn't like them. I, I wouldn't want to eat many no, more than It's a that. delicacy. Yeah. And they say, of course, that the best way to eat oysters is don't chew them. That's what they say. That's what they say. Just let it slip down your throat whole. And as Craig says, it's a taste of the sea. It's like... It's like a fleshy bit of sea. You really taste the sea water, don't you? It's quite a strange experience. That's right. Well, those are our 10 shellfish and seafood. Let's go back and uh, hear them again. Lobster, prawns, squid, cuttlefish, crab, clams, crayfish, octopus, mussels, and oysters. Remember to see those written. Go to englishpodcast.com slash 217. You can also see more translated fish on our website mansioningles.com go to mansioningles.com slash vocabulario 34.htm that link is also in the show notes Reza, can you think of any expressions or vocabulary that might be useful connected to fish? Well, you can simply fish. To fish is a verb. Or you can say to catch a fish. Also, to go fishing is to go to a place specifically to fish. So, for example, if you want to spend the whole day you know, having, a, having a, a good time, might take three or four hours or five hours, you go fishing. To do that, you're going to need a fishing rod. What's a fishing rod, Craig? That's caña de pesca. Caña de pesca, fishing rod. So you take your fishing rod and your line, and at the end of your line, you need to put a hook, which is gancho. So you put hook on the end of your line to catch your fish. And of course, you also need a little bit of bait, B-A-I-T, bait, which is what goes on the hook, which causes the fish to bite the hook. And then there's a verb, isn't there, to throw the hook and the bait out into the river or sea. What's that verb in English to throw out the line? That's to cast, C-A-S-T. So lanthar, when you throw it out and you hope when it goes into the water that a fish will bite the bait on the hook. 
Have you ever been fishing? Do you like uh, going fishing? I've only ever done it a couple of times in my life, but I enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I was a teenager fishing off rocks on the coast of Donegal. Sea fishing then. And I caught a couple of mackerel straight from the sea. It was a great experience. It mm-hmm. was really good fun. What about you? I've been a couple of times, again, sea fishing when I was younger, down on the south coast of England. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed it, but it was more because I was with my my ex-brother-in-law who took me there. So it was an occasion of two people together just enjoying some time together and fishing was the excuse. So I didn't really enjoy the activity of fishing, but it was nice to spend time alone with him. But I have been fishing on a fish farm, which is perfect because you're definitely going to catch a fish. And then when you take the fish out of the fish farm, you put it on a barbecue and eat it. So it's not really a sport of fishing. You definitely, it's impossible not to catch a fish because there are so many. And of course you have lunch while you're there. So that's a nice way to be with people and to have a social uh, social meal together and catch your food. Craig, you said earlier that one of the things that puts you off, that discourages you from eating fish is the the preparation and the, the difficulty in eating them because there are bones and things like that. There are also scales on fish, which sometimes are unpleasant to eat. What are scales? I think in Spanish it's escamas. Yes. On the outside of the fish, kind of like a skin. And uh, yeah, sometimes if you don't descale the fish, if you don't take the scales off the fish, then uh, they end up or finish in your mouth, which is not very pleasant at all. And, And if you prepare the fish, if you clean the fish at home, if lots of scales get into your sink in La Pila, they can block it up. It can be a real nightmare getting rid of them. It's a, it's a messy business. It is. Cleaning fish. Very it is. messy. Speaking of fishing, there's another word, fishing with a different spelling and a completely different meaning. Well, not completely different, maybe. Fishing, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, is connected to the internet or stealing, obtaining sensitive information using false emails, trying to get your passwords. So a phishing scam, P-H-I-S-H, a phishing scam is where people illegally try to get your personal details. Maybe they pretend that they are you. So if you hear the expression a phishing expedition, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to a river or the sea with your fishing rods. It might mean that you are trying to trap someone on the internet and steal their identity. Why do they call it phishing? I think because they blanket send many emails or social messages or texts to hundreds of thousands or even millions of people. And it's a bit like casting your bait in the river or the sea to try and catch a fish. But I don't know why they changed the spelling. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure there's someone listening who will correct me if that is not correct. But that's the impression I have. It's just trying to get people to bite the hook and take the bait. Would an example be something like this? I have unexpectedly received uh, $1 million from the Nigerian government. And uh, the problem is I shouldn't have this money and I need to get rid of it, and put it into a European bank. If you, complete stranger, who I trust completely, will give me your bank account details so I can put my million dollars in your bank, I'll let you keep 20,000. Is that what you mean? But it could be, although that's more kind of spam or scamming. It, it, I think it's more, and cor- again, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure there are many IT professionals listening. I think it's more where somebody hacks into my email account and gets control of my email account, and then they send you an email from me and the title of the email is see what you did last night on in this video and then you open up your email and there's a link in the video which looks like it's going to a youtube video but when you click on it it downloads something into your computer Ah, okay. so they're saying oh this email's from craig or yes i did go out last night and i did i did go out with friends and i got a bit drunk let me see what video somebody took of me but it's catching you, as you would catch a fish, into clicking the link and then getting access to to your computer. (music) 
So we've got some expressions connected to fish and fishing. There are plenty more fish in the sea or there are more fish in the sea. When would you use or hear that expression, Reza? Well, that's a very common expression used whenever someone is disappointed because they weren't successful, let's say, in their amorous adventures, or perhaps their boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife has just left them, so they're now alone. And you say to this person to make them feel better, you cheer them up saying, oh, don't worry, there are plenty more fish in the sea. So imagine you've been fishing, this one got away, but you know, there are plenty of other fish outside there that might take the bit. They might bite your your hook and you can reel them in R W E L, bring them in and you've got them. So don't don't worry, don't lose, don't lose hope. And if you do find somebody that you have a relationship with who perhaps has a lot of money or a very nice position or a beautiful house or a very nice person who has a lovely personality, you might hear the expression, he's a good catch or she's a good catch or she's quite a catch. That means you've been very lucky to have met this person and to be in a relationship with that person. You're very fortunate to have that person for whatever reason. Another common expression in English is to say someone drinks like a fish. Do you mean drinks water? No, I'm afraid I don't. <laughs> I mean specifically drink alcohol. Ah. But it's it's understood, it's intrinsic in the the expression. So if I say to you, oh, he drinks like a fish, that means he drinks a lot of alcohol. Do you know anyone who drinks like a fish? I mean, you drink moderately, you don't drink a yeah. lot. So I would not say that you drink like a fish. Yes, I well, not personally, but I know of at least about three million people. That's half the population of Ireland. So yeah, <laughs> six million, half, three million. Yeah, about, about three million people I know who drink like a fish. They drink like a fish. Another expression is to fall for something, hook, line, and sinker. Now, let's look at those words. Hook, we said was gancho. When you're trying to hook a fish, you use a hook. Line is the fishing line that attaches to the reel, as Reza said, and then goes up the rod, the fishing rod. And the sinker is a small piece of metal that gives weight to the hook and the bait. So especially if you're sea fishing, you want the bait to go down under the water and you use something called a sinker so that it falls below the surface. So if you fall for something, hook, line and sinker, then you fall for something or you accept something completely. For example, if you tell somebody a lie or you invent a story and you tell somebody and they believe you, you could say, oh, yes, she fell for it, hook, line and sinker. She completely believed me. She completely trusted me, for example. A very common expression in English is to say that something smells a bit fishy. If I say it smells a bit fishy to me, I'm saying in colloquial English, I'm suspicious. I'm not sure I'm, I, I entirely trust uh, what's going on here. You know, I'm, I think not, something's not quite right. Somebody's lying or things are not the way they should be. It smells a bit fishy because as we all know, fish, which isn't fresh, which isn't good, quickly smells. And it's a strange, unpleasant smell. Even if the fish is in your fridge and uh, the door is closed. You can still, you can still smell it. It's a, it's, it's a smell that gets everywhere. So if I said to you, Reza, that I'm selling my car for 700 euros, would you fall for that hook, line and sinker? No, it seems too cheap. A car, 700 euros, smells a bit fishy to me. I reckon this car is, is stolen or it's, it's going to break down after about 10 minutes. Smells fishy. You could be sometimes in a place or a situation that makes you feel really uncomfortable. You don't feel happy. Something's not right. You feel in an uncomfortable position. You could say you feel like a fish out of water. Obviously, fish need water. They're always in water. If not, they die. So if you feel like a fish out of water, you don't feel comfortable. You're in a strange or unusual 
situation. When was the last time you felt like a fish out of water? Do you remember? Yes, possibly when I was hoping that Liverpool Football Club would win the Champions League. And I happened to be watching the game in Spain, surrounded almost exclusively by Real Madrid supporters <laughs> <laughs> who wanted Real Madrid to win, and they did. Uh, I certainly felt like a fish out of water then. I could imagine, especially when I won. I, I had the good fortune, though, that I had one Spanish friend with me who is a die hard, that means the Nucleo Duro, supporter of Atletico Madrid. Is that and Coco? He, <laughs> no, that wasn't Coco. No, I'm not sure who he supports. Uh, and of course, as you all know, if you know anything about football, Atletico Madrid hate Real Madrid and vice versa. So he was delighted to help me support Liverpool. He was, was on, he was on your side. Yes, he was my only support. Apart from that, I was a fish out of water. Sometimes you might invite people to stay in your house or in your flat and sleep where you live. So you might put them up for a few days. To put someone up, the phrasal verb to put someone up means to let them sleep in your house or in your flat. Now, if they stay too long, it might not be very good, especially if they're not considerate house guests. So there's an expression that guests and fish smell bad after three days. Obviously, if you have fish outside of the fridge in Valencia in August, after three days, it's going to smell very badly. Well, even in the fridge, it's going to smell bad after three days. I wouldn't keep it in the fridge for three days, eh? <laughs> exactly. So similar with guests, if they stay too long, they start to smell bad or they start to annoy you. We've both had smelly house guests, haven't we, Reza? Yes. It's, it's a pity <laughs> we don't have more time um, because... You we've know, got, we we've don't got some go. stories. We've but got some stories. All, all I'm going to tell you is that it's a pity Craig doesn't have time to tell you the story about Mr. Mayonnaise. I love the story about that, the, the guest who overstayed his welcome. And by the way, this story includes squid um, sepia as well, by the way. Mr. Mayonnaise, what a great story. That. And if you're listening, you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, there's one. If you've seen the film Jaws, Tiburon, you probably remember near the end when the shark actually appears. And I can't remember the name of the actor, the captain of the Richard Dreyfus or the captain of the ship. One of the actors said, we're going to need a bigger boat. You remember that line? I can't remember. They see the Roy they, Schneider's in it. Is it him? Roy Schneider's in it. It's not him though, no? Maybe it's him. And there's another actor too that's very famous who's also in it. But one of them on the boat, one of the three says, when they see the size of the shark, they have a small fishing boat and they say, we're going to need a bigger boat. Now that quote from the film has kind of become used in the language for a situation, an analogy where, for example, you buy some food for a party and suddenly you realize loads of people are coming to the party. You might say, oh, we're going to need a bigger boat because there are more people coming. Or perhaps you're going on holiday, you have a very small suitcase and you, ne you need to pack a lot of things in your suitcase. You might say, I think we need a bigger boat, which really means we need a bigger suitcase. So in many situations, it's used for something else. Have you heard that expression? I haven't, no, but I can guess it's meaning quite easily. But I hadn't heard it myself. I quite like it. Yeah, me too. And now it's your turn to practice your English. What's your favourite fish? Do you like shellfish? And if you do, how do you like to eat it? How do you like to cook it? We'd love to hear your personal stories. And why not send us a voice message to practice this fish vocabulary? You can send us a voice message by SpeakPipe, which is at speakpipe.com slash Inglés podcast or use the application on your mobile phone from the app store or you can send us an email with a comment or question to reza at belfastreza at gmail.com or to craig at craig at inglespodcast.com before we go we'd like to say thank you to our wonderful patrons on patreon starting with our gold sponsor mr bruno who does walking tours of two cities copenhagen with his company CopenhagenWalkingTour.com. And also, if you're going to Rio de Janeiro, 
don't forget to get in touch with Bruno and try his walking tours of the favelas in Rio de Janeiro. And you can find information for that at favelawalkingtour.com.br. All of the information and links are on his website. And to go there, go to inglespodcast.com where you can find links to his website. Also, thank you to our other wonderful patrons of the show who are supporting us. They are Ana Giovanna, Dana Constantin, Pachi Ibañaz, Manuel Tarazona, Juan Carlos Rorado, Maite Palacín Pérez, Lara Allem, Néstor from Luces Estrañas, María Gervati, Lorena Sarajarabo, Carlos Garrido, Mamin, Juan Leiva Guerrera, Cory Finneran from the baseball podcast IVMV.com, Miren Full, José Luis Araguay, Agus Paulucci, María Raidamen, Manuel García Betagón, Raúl López, Rafael, José Manuel Fernández Picazo, Pilar Martínez, Combate Blog, Igor Garmendia, Ignacio Espona, Kieran, Ana Herbara, Marina Ortez Pena, Juan Carlos Pantin Fernández, Alejandro Pluma, Alex Cuadra, José Emilio Villena, Esperanza Colmenero, Emilio Manuel Martínez Rivas, Chema Santa Cruz, Ana Fernández Monterrubio, Carlos Caño Domingo, Gustavo, Antonio Díaz, José Antonio Muñoz, Eva María Elzalde Martínez, Arminda Fafo, Carlos Sánchez, Elvira Cortés, Francisco Javier Alejandre Sebastián and Reza, who are our latest patrons who are supporting the show? Our most recent patrons are Andrea Mio, Rogelio Menéndez, Antonio Lafuente, Eloy, Pablo Martínez, Miguel, and Javier Correa Sambade. Thank you to all of you. And I'm very happy and very proud to say that we are very, very close now to our goal of $100 per month, which are providing the transcriptions every week for you to read as you're listening if you need that extra support and reference. So if you would like to join that lovely long list of patrons of the show, go to patreon.com slash English podcast, where for only one dollar minimum per month you can get instant access to recent transcriptions of the podcast lovingly transcribed by Angelica Bello from Madrid. And not only that, as an added extra, you'll get to hear your name read out at the end of every podcast by Craig or me in a giri accent, which is kind of fun. <laughs> And thank you also to Patricia Alonso, who continues working to transcribe episodes for you. We now have available episodes 1 to 20, 131 to 142. They are free on the website at inglespodcast.com. Reza, what are we speaking about on next week's podcast? How to change the subject in English. Okay, until then, thank you very much for listening. It's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later.